Everybody doing okay? Man, it's good to see you guys. Everybody ready for Christmas? It's just a few weeks away, isn't it? Have you got everything you need to get? No, especially me. It's definitely the case for myself. I need to get my wife a few gifts because I would be in the doghouse if I did not, right? Um, man, I want to give you a quick update on Pastor Eric. Um, he's doing really, really well. He'll be back, I'm sure, in a few weeks, maybe a month. We're not really sure on the timeline yet, but he is healing up, and we really appreciate you guys praying for him, and I know that he misses everyone, and uh, man, he loves his congregation, and we cannot wait to have him back, amen? Yeah, so continue to pray for him. Uh, let's, let's start off, let's just pray, let's, let's invite the Holy Spirit uh, here just to breathe upon uh, this morning's message. Oh, Holy Spirit, we are here for you. We're not here for some eloquent words or stories or anything else, but Lord, we want above everything else to hear your voice, Holy Spirit. So would you speak? We say to you right now, speak for your servants are listening. Have your will and your way in this place, God. We don't just as Moses prayed, we don't want to move from here without you. And so, Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Speak to our hearts. We are open to what you want to do this morning. We love you. We thank you. We bless you. And everyone said, amen, amen. So we are preparing our hearts to celebrate the coming of Jesus, his birth. And we're in a series entitled, An Even better Christmas, and it's really all about, man, we're going to get past all of the uh, busyness of the season and just really take a moment to step back and to put our thoughts, our concentration on him, amen? Uh, last week, uh, Pastor Adrian brought a word on joy. You know, joy is uh, it's not about happiness because happiness is fleeting, but when we abide in Christ, we can have joy. So I pray that this week you've Use that message and you've been able to stir up a heart of joy in the season. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about a very popular passage, a very popular story. It's a story of, of wise men coming to give gifts to Jesus. So I want you to visualize this for a moment. And as you visualize it, you're probably thinking back to grandma's house and a manger scene that you saw when you were a kid. You know what I'm talking about? There was... Uh, more than likely in there, there was some farm animals, a sheep, a goat, a cow, right? If there's a pitched roof, there's an angel on top. There's some wise men there, and they probably have some flowing robes, and it's made of porcelain, because that's what grandma kind of tend to have, porcelain, manger scene. And then there's baby Jesus in the bottom, and he's glowing because there's a nightlight underneath him. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The problem with this story, the problem, the challenge with this visualization is it's not all the way accurate. So scholars believe that there was more than three wise men. We don't really know how many wise men there really were. And then by the time these wise men got to Jesus, he was no longer in a manger, but he was in a house because he was 18 months to two years old. So it really kind of changes our visualization when we think of these wise men coming to bring these extravagant gifts to Jesus, and he was a toddler by that time. How many of you have a two-year-old that's living in your house right now? A two-year-old. Man, God bless you. We are praying for you. I mean, my goodness, you know what I'm saying? Like, and you're probably thinking, you. yes, I need it right now. How many of you have ever had a two-year-old? Yeah. And so for those of us who never had a two-year-old, we've only been around a two-year-old. I know when I was 25, I would judge those who had a two-year-old because I would be in a store and maybe the two-year-old is banging on the table or throwing a tantrum in the middle of Target, whatever it might be, and I'm sitting there, why can't those parents just get their kid underneath control, right? And then when I had a two-year-old, I realized, man, we do not negotiate with terrorists. Like... Uh, it is a difficult season when we have two-year-olds, is it not? 
And we feel like bad parents, but then after a while, we kind of fight the urge to give them the iPhone, but we end up giving them the iPhone because we want to enjoy the meal that we're, that, that we're partaking in in that moment. Or maybe, hey, just give them a piece of candy, give them whatever they want, like just, well, I want to enjoy myself. I don't know what parents did before, uh, before iPhones uh, to enjoy a meal out to eat. I don't really think they probably went out to eat at all because they understood, but I can't enjoy this with a two-year-old. So we really kind of change the visualization of the wise men here in this moment when we really think about what really happened in this story. Wise men coming to bring extravagant gifts to Jesus, and he was two years old. A challenging visual process. The magi, the wise men bowing down, offering these gifts perhaps to a toddler, these very unusual gifts. What I want to do this morning is I want to take a look at the text and give you some some context and then we're going to look at these three gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus. So scripture says this of the wise men, Matthew 2, 10 through 11. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold frankincense, and myrrh. Unusual gifts for the day and age that we live in, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but very valuable gifts, very useful gifts for that time, and gifts that were symbolic in nature and prophesied who Jesus would become. They were unusual gifts. So I've gotten some unusual gifts, and this has really no spiritual value to it, but I thought I would share these unusual gifts that I've personally gotten. Uh, I've gotten these gifts, uh, these unusual gifts that I've received at White Elephant Christmas Gifts Exchanges. You know what I'm talking about. Like, so what you do is you draw a number and then more than likely this like gag gift type thing, like you just bring something from your house that's already, that you didn't really want and uh, you bring them to there or you're, uh, you have a limit of how much you could spend, $5 to $20 kind of thing. And it's kind of like a fun thing. So number one gets to go first and then you can steal a gift, and obviously, because I got stuck with these gifts, these gifts were not stolen from me. Now, actually, one of them actually did steal. I'm about to show you. So the first gift, though, that was not stolen was, I got a cat t-shirt. I mean, come on. That thing is hideous, but I love to wear it at ugly uh, sweater Christmas parties. I mean, look at the cats. I mean, it's amazing. You got a spaceship up there, everything. The second gift that I got, I actually stole at this white elephant Christmas because I love Oreo cookies. Uh, so you put the milk in this mug, has a little holder for your Oreo cookies. I mean, isn't that really, really nice? And it actually also comes with these red tongs because I like to keep my Oreos fully dipped in the milk, if you know what I'm talking about. Like, I went in there for probably 15 to 20 seconds. My wife likes her Oreos in there a little bit longer, but they get soggy. You don't want to get your hands in a mess. You know what I'm talking about? So you take the tongs, you get the Oreos out, and you're able to eat it. Very useful, unusual gift, though, right? Now, the second gift was given to me at a uh, Christmas party for the worship team. And this was passed around from year to year. And it's a picture of Jesus, but a very creepy picture of Jesus. I mean, that's a creepy picture of Jesus. That is not my Lord and Savior. It it is not. So do not get offended by this at all, but that is not Jesus. It's just a creepy picture. Unusual gifts. The Magi, they brought these unusual gifts to Jesus. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, gold was uh, obviously throughout history It's of monetary value, but when they brought gold to Jesus, it represented that he was king of kings and lord of lords. When the other uh, magi came and gave the gift of frankincense, frankincense represents that he is the great high priest, that the veil was torn in two, that we have access to the Father through Jesus. And the third gift, which I really want to concentrate the remainder of our time on this morning, is the gift of myrrh. The gift of myrrh. The gift of myrrh represented the Lamb of God who would be slain for our sin. That's what it really represented. Now, the practical use of the gift of myrrh was back in those days, myrrh was used as an antiseptic. So Jesus was offered uh, myrrh mixed with wine 
when he gave his life on the cross to kind of dull the pain. But he rejected myrrh and wine because he, didn't, he wanted to take on the full sins of what we've committed. He wanted to feel the full weight of it. The other use of, of myrrh was it was a use to embalm people back in the day. So it would be used for the dead. But the main thing that myrrh represents is myrrh represents and symbolizes here, scholars believe, and I fully, wholeheartedly believe, is it represented Jesus as the Lamb of God. Jesus as our God who took on our sin on the cross and shed his blood for us. That's what it represents, myrrh. So what I want to do for the remainder of our time together is I want to look at an Old Testament prophetic passage from Isaiah 53. Isaiah prophesied this 700 years before the birth of Christ, a very detailed account. I'm going to show you how myrrh represents Jesus as the Lamb of God, the suffering servant who was born to suffer on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins. But first I'm going to show you our problem because we have a problem. Say, turn to someone and say, I've got a problem. Come on, turn, turn to someone and say, I've got a problem. We all have a problem. Then I'm going to show you the price that Jesus paid for this sinful problem that we all have. Let's start with our problem, Isaiah 53, 6. It says this. All of us like sheep. Say, like sheep. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Isaiah says you are like sheep. And unfortunately for us, him calling us sheep is not a compliment at all. It's not a compliment. I mean, if he said, hey, all of you like lions, now that's a compliment, big bad lion, right? All of you like eagles, hey, you're soaring in the sky and you're the king of the air. That would be a compliment. But he says, no, all of you like sheep. I mean, sheep are not very smart creatures at all. They're, 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 not, they're not witty. They're, 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 they're weak creatures. They're, they're wayward creatures. They can't be trained. I mean, dogs can be trained. Cats can even be trained. Hamsters can be trained. Uh, all, they can't be trained. I mean, they are not very smart creatures. They are weak they are witless and they're wayward. They're weak. I mean, think about it. If an animal comes to try to attack a sheep, the sheep is completely defenseless. They don't have fangs to, to come back at them. They don't have, uh, they can't fly away. They can't uh, run away because they're not fast. They don't uh, have any other means. They don't have a poisonous tongue. They don't have any other means to defend themselves, right? They're witless. I mean, they just kind of follow the pack. If an animal comes to attack them, they huddle up. It's not like they go this way and that way. It's like they huddle up and it's like, hey, just take the, the pick right now. Like, just kind of pick us off. You can take whichever sheep you want. It doesn't matter. They're witless. They don't have, a matter of fact, there's a story, and it's a true story. In 2005 in Turkey, there was 1,400 sheep. And the sheep are so dumb and they don't make any decisions for themselves that they actually followed each other off of a cliff. I promise, true story. So one sheep falls off a cliff. The second sheep follows that sheep and falls off a cliff. The third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, seventh one, tenth one, goes on and on. You would think that a sheep would get the picture that, hey, that sheep is dead underneath me. I don't know what's going on right now, right? But they are so dumb and do dumb sheep things that they continue to fall off. Now only 400 of the sheep actually died because they created a sheep pillow at the bottom of this cliff. I mean, dumb. True story. You can look it up. Google it. They're wayward. Sheep are wayward. They get lost very easily. Aren't we wayward? Don't we look for a relationship sometime to fulfill us? Don't we look for money fulfill the needs of our hearts? Don't we look for material things? We're wayward. We, all of us have gone astray. We're wayward. 
And when Isaiah compares us to sheep, he's not saying to us, wow, you're really amazing. No, he's saying you've got some really big issues. We're wayward, just as sheep. Now let's look at the price that Jesus paid for this problem that we all have. The price that Jesus paid for our waywardness, for our weakness. Here's what Scripture says, Isaiah 53. Again, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet, the Lord laid on him the suffering servant, the one who would be called Jesus. The Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Now remember, this is 700 years before Christ was born. Verse 7, Isaiah prophesied. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Have you ever been hurt? Have you ever been mistreated? Have you ever been misunderstood? Have you ever been unjustly criticized or rejected? The thing is, Jesus understands you. Because he felt that. Verse 3. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows. Acquainted with deepest grief. We turn our backs on him and look the other way. He was despised and he did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment of his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. That's what Jesus would do for us. When you understand the magnitude of the suffering servant, when you understand the magnitude, the depth of the love of Jesus, you can't just be casual about your Christianity any longer. You can't just say, hey, I'm a Christian, and then go about your life living and doing whatever you want to do. You can't just sit down and just pray a simple prayer and go about it and just kind of go through the motions any longer. When you really understand the magnitude, the depth of the love of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, everything changes. It's all different. I want to try to tell you the story that I know all of you have read and heard, but my prayer is it becomes alive in your heart today. Now, I can't really do it justice, but I'm going to try. Let's start in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was there battling with the Father. He got a glimpse of what he was going to have to endure on the cross. And he says to the Father, remove this cup from me. Basically, remove this suffering from me, Father. He asked his disciples to pray. But his disciples, they fall asleep. Left there, all alone, blood begins to drip from his brow. The medical term for this is hemosidrosis, which is when your capillaries literally burst from extreme trauma. 
And Jesus falls down the ground and blood begins to drip from the trauma that he's feeling because he knows what is about to happen. He asks his father, Lord, is there any other way that we can go about this? Is there anything we can do? Because this really seems extreme. I know it was coming, but man, it's the reality is hitting him right in this moment. The magnitude of the suffering. The magnitude. He faithfully then declares, not my will, but God, yours be done. Not my will, but Lord, yours be done. One of his own, Judas, comes and betrays him with a kiss. He's arrested, falsely accused, and sentenced to death by crucifixion. They place a crown of thorns on his head. The thorns are an inch to two inches in length. And they push it down on our Lord's head. And they're mocking him because he's the king of the Jews. And then the beating begins. And again, and again, and again, they beat his back to bloody pulp. Every single lash, flesh gets ripping out. Many believe that organs, because of the depth of, 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 of the lashes, organs began to be exposed. They took a club, beat it on his head, so the crown of thorns would seek in even deeper. They took signet rings and began to punch his face in. Isaiah alludes that they would pull out his beard and that he would become so disfigured that they couldn't even recognize him any longer. So disfigured, broken, hurting, and in agony, they give Jesus a beam to carry, weighing 100 pounds or so. He had to take this 650 yards on a road leading to Golgotha. They crucify him. They put nails in his wrist. Seven inches long, and they hammer them in. And the pain of our Lord, and in his feet, the pain and the suffering that he went through, the nails in his wrist, the nails in his feet. They offer him myrrh mixed with wine. And he rejects it because he wants to take on the full weight of what he's having to go through and walk through. But it's not even the worst part of it. The worst part is he took on everything vile, everything filthy, everything unholy, everything demonic. He took it on. And that relationship that he always knew with, between Jesus, that intimate fellowship that he had with his father, it left because the father could no longer look upon him because of sin. And so bearing our sin, bearing our weight, he was left alone on the cross. Left alone. And in pain and agony, no longer knowing the fellowship of his father, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? In the moment he needed someone the most, he's there, left on a bloody cross. 
Isaiah prophetically declared that this child born of a virgin never sinned would endure our sinfulness and that was his mission Isaiah continued and he wrote of the suffering servant and said in verse 8 through 9 unjustly condemned he was led away no one cared that he died without descendants that his life was cut short in midstream but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people he had done no wrong and had never been and never deceived anyone but he was buried like a criminal in a rich man's grave. How did Isaiah know 700 years before it happened that Joseph of Arimathea would offer Jesus his grave? Verse 11, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. When he understands what would happen, when he understands that he could have relationship with us, then he will be satisfied for the cost that he had to pay. And because of experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, righteous, for he will bear all of their sins. What is it that separates Christianity apart from all other religions? From Islam, from Hinduism, from Buddhism, from New Age. What is it that separates us apart? It is the bloody death of an innocent lamb. The bloody death of an innocent victim, of our Jesus, of our Savior. This is mirrored in the Old Testament with the Passover. See, once a year, God would execute his temporary judgment on the sins of the people. He would unleash the most fierce force in the universe, his righteous judgment on all of mankind. What could protect you from this judgment? Well, the blood of an innocent lamb. So a family would take a lamb, a one-year-old lamb, and sacrifice this lamb, eat its meat, but then take the blood of this lamb and put it on top of the doorpost of their home and on the side of its home. Then death would pass over the house because that family was saved by a blood of an innocent lamb. Death would pass them over. So when you think about that story, it's, it seems out there, it seems really weird, but yet all the way back in that historic event, we see that it foreshadowed when the blood of the Lamb of God would be shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So when you visualize it this Christmas, when you see a manger scene this Christmas, understand that the gift that the wise men brought of myrrh represented what Jesus would have to go through and celebrate in that moment, I'm not condemned to death anymore. But if I give my life fully and completely over to him, I can have life and life abundantly. Myrrh foreshadows this. Jesus also prophesied this about himself. This is what Jesus declared. Luke chapter 9, 22, he said of himself, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, he must be killed. And on the third day, raised to life. This is Jesus speaking about himself. Then he said to all of them, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple. Whoever wants to be my disciple. Now let me tell you what he didn't say before I tell you what he did say. He didn't say you can just pray some prayer and all of a sudden everything's going to be honkadory and everything's going to be amazing. He didn't say, hey, just pray a prayer of salvation and you're going to be okay. It's going to be like you're running through a field with Jesus for the rest of your life. No, G- this, that's not what he said. The invitation, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, is to deny yourself. Deny yourself. He's telling you it's not about you. It's not about what your wants. It's not about your needs. Take up your cross. Take up your cross. The cross that Jesus bore? Are you serious? Like that kind of depth? Like deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. You see, this can't be just something that we do. It can't just be a weekend thing. It can't just be a hobby or an add-on to the weekend that we go through. And we, Hey, I'm a Christian. I'm going to pray a prayer and everything's going to be okay. You see, when you understand the magnitude of the cross, when you understand the magnitude that Jesus understood, and Isaiah prophesied 700 years before that Jesus would be born of a virgin and give, live a perfect life and give his life up for us, the only appropriate response is, Lord, thank you, Lord, I worship you, Lord, you are so good, Lord, you're so worthy. That is the only appropriate response in this season. It's not about the gifts, it's not about Santa Claus, it's not about anything else. It's about Him. It's about Him coming for people who are unworthy. People who are sheep, who walk waywardly away. But He draws them back in His grace and in His mercy. That's what it's about. The only appropriate response is worship. Just shut your eyes for a moment right now. You just say, Lord, I worship you. God, I honor you. Come on, just to yourself right now. You're worthy, Jesus. You are so good, Father. Thank you, Lord. That you are worthy of it all. Just sing this with me. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Yes, you are, oh God. You are worthy of it all. Come on, tell him. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. Yes, you deserve the glory. And oh, come, let us adore you. Oh, come, let us adore you. Tell him. Oh, come, let us adore you. Oh, come, let us adore you. Oh, come, let him cry. So I said the only appropriate response is worship to Him. 
I want to give you two more things, though. In this season, it's a decision to live every moment for God. A decision to be so keenly aware of Him, where your whole life is devoted to Him. What do you say? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. We worship Him, one. We give our entire lives to Him, two. The third thing is how cruel would it be of us if we understood the magnitude of his love, but we did not tell other people about it. You know the feelings inside of your heart when you go and share the gospel with someone? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're scared. It doesn't matter if it's difficult for you. You see, if you're really a disciple of Jesus, disciples make disciples. No negotiating about it. Disciples make disciples. Who is your three people? Who's your three people, four people, five people, six people? Who, who are your people that you are discipling right now? We must take this season of a time where people will listen to the gospel, will accept an invitation even to come to church because sometimes that's the easiest thing to do. We must use this season as a tool to share the gospel with someone, the good news of Jesus. Maybe it's that waitress at lunch today after church. Maybe it's that coworker you've never shared the gospel with before. Maybe it's a neighbor of yours. I don't know who it is in your life. But man, there's invite cards. I think some of your seat, there's some of the next steps counter. Invite someone to our Christmas Eve services. They're at 4 o'clock in, is it 4 o'clock? No, 4.30 and 6 o'clock. I'm sorry, 4.30 and 6 o'clock. That's the times. Invite someone. Use it as a tool and invite them out. But more than anything else, man, share your testimony. Share what Christ means to you with someone. Our appropriate response is worship, life completely devoted to him, and sharing the love of Jesus to someone. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, the ministry team will invite you forward right now. At the end, after I pray, if you have prayer for anything at all, I invite you forward to receive ministry. If you want to give your life to Jesus this morning, then do not leave this place without talking with someone in this place. It's your opportunity today. Let's pray right now. God. May the visualization of the manger be real in our lives. Not just something we've seen, not just passing us by, but every moment when we see it, God, may we be reminded of the gift of myrrh. The wise men came and brought you that foreshadowed the death on the cross, that you would live a perfect life for us so that we can have relationship. The agony, the pain, you went through, God, would be real in our hearts in this season. Lord, we celebrate you. It sounds cliche, but Lord, you really are the reason for this season. You really are the one that our attention and our affection needs to be on. So I pray you would guard our hearts in this season, Jesus. Lord, help us to minister to our families. Help us to show others, God, what the meaning of this season is really all about. We love you. We bless you. And everyone said, amen, amen. Hey, if you need prayer for anything this morning, I'll invite you forward. Uh, Everyone else is dismissed this morning. Hey, thank you so much for coming. We love you guys. God bless you. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, we'd love to pray with you at the front. Have a great week.